Ladies and gentlemen, the next phase of the war has begun. Israel has started a limited ground operation in southern Lebanon targeting Hezbollah. Even though Israel hasn't provided any timeline, it's stated that there will be no long-term occupation of Lebanon. Now, the latest ground offensive, remember, comes after multiple Israeli raids and artillery fire across the border. Ahead of the invasion, Israel's security cabinet approved the next phase of its war with Hezbollah. Israel's escalation, remember, defies U.S. directions to reach a ceasefire. American Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin spoke with his Israeli counterpart, Defense Minister Yaov Gallant, to review security developments and Israeli operations. This is according to a Pentagon readout. My colleague Deepak Bopanna spoke with Israel's Council General Orly Weitzman on her country's strategy, the wider war and the safety of Indians. Listen in. How is this going to affect your relationship with, you know, Lebanon, other neighboring countries? Will this escalate into a larger conflict overall? So I hope very much not. Uh, Israel, again, Israel has no interest in escalating uh, the, the situation. It really depends uh, how uh, how um, uh, the other parties will react. Again, we, we are hoping very much for, for a diplomatic solution. Uh, and, and once uh, the arms are put down and people are willing to accept that uh, Israel has to defend its uh, citizens and are willing to live in peace, there will be no conflict anymore. Okay. And what about, uh, you know, the polit some of the political parties in the country and a very some, some of the senior political leaders as well uh, condemning the killing and coming in support of somebody like Nasrallah? How do you really look at that? What Would you like to say anything to some of these leaders, especially in India that I'm talking about? I think that if any leader who, who understands the need to support, I mean, any leader knows that it's it's number one job of every government, of every leader is to to. Uh, to look after their people. That's That, I think, is a true leader. A true leader wants to defend its people and to make sure uh, that the people are safe in their own country. And I think that most leaders would understand that if their people were under attack, and if their people uh, were threatened on a daily basis by missiles, they would do the responsible thing as well to make sure that their people live safely. But for some of them, uh, you know, to look at somebody like, uh, you know, Nasrallah as, as an icon, uh, what do you make of that? I think it's uh, it's very sad. I think that uh, Nasrallah has killed not only uh, Israelis and Jews, but they've killed uh, American citizens, French citizens, other Muslims, uh, Sunni, lots of Sunni Muslims. So this person uh, is is responsible for the death of many, many, many people. To see to idolize him, I think is um, is is tragic. It's tragic. Okay. Finally, I'd like to ask you. Uh, very recently, of course, Israel was looking at hiring at least about ten thousand Indians for construction, also in the healthcare sector. Um, you know, with what's happening at this point in time, uh, with these sort of military conflicts, if I may call it, uh, what what would you like to say about the safety of these Indians who would like to go to Israel, work there? Is it absolutely safe for them? Uh, what's the uh, you know way forward for these people? So I think that Israel does uh, and, and has been doing throughout the last year. There have been people who coming from, from India and from other places as well. And also during the attacks themselves, Israel did everything it can, it, it could to protect any citizens, Israeli citizens uh, or Indian citizens or any other, any person uh, who was in Israel. And Israel keeps doing that. So there are many different measures that are taken. There are safety. First of all, Israel, uh, if you see, because Israel luckily has invested a lot of its, uh, of a lot of its um, uh, money and abilities in order to develop the Iron Dome and other uh, and other um, abilities that basically pr are, uh, offer very big protection to all the people who are in Israel, whether Israeli or not. I mean, they don't discriminate. As the, the Iron Dome doesn't discriminate uh, different people. And every person working in Israel, no matter where he's from, always has access to safe rooms uh, and is treated exactly the same as all Israeli citizens. And Israel is doing, like I said, when I said that Israel has to protect its citizens, it has to protect anybody who is in Israel, whether it's Israeli, Indian or any other nationality. Now, even as world leaders and organizations urge for restraint, the escalation in the war has killed more than 1,000 people so far, destroyed homes and displaced 1 million in Lebanon so far. To talk more on this, I am joined by Major General Dhruv Katoch. He's a defense expert, also director, India Foundation. I'll also be joined by Israeli as well as Palestinian voices on the broadcast in a short while from now. But uh, Major General Katoch, Namaskar, good evening. Welcome to Mirror Now. Um, this is, you know, this was being speculated about. This this was one of the fears uh, which has now come true. 
Israel launching a ground offensive, a ground invasion into Lebanon. What started as Operation Northern Arrows has now obviously shifted its focus to southern Lebanon as well. How do you see this, really, this latest ground offensive by Israel? Uh, I think this was expected, very frankly, uh, because right from the time, you know, um, let me go back one year. On the 7th of October, when the dastardly attack took place on uh, Israeli civilians, on the very next day, on the 8th of October, missiles started being fired from Lebanon. And they have continued firing those missiles. I, th I think th the, these missiles have been fired in thousands uh, over the last one year. Now, it was important for Israel to actually stop this missile from being fired from Lebanon. And if you look at the geography of Lebanon, the southern portion of Lebanon is largely a Shia, a Shia, control, a Shia dominated area. Uh, by Shia, I mean uh, population wise. Uh, most of the population there the, uh, is Shia. Now, uh, I expect that this limited, uh, limited offensive, I don't think it is going to go to the length and breadth of uh, Lebanon. I think it will be just about enough to ensure that at least the short-range missiles cannot be fired from there. Either the artillery or the short-range missiles cannot be fired from southern, southern Lebanon onto Israel. And that once that objective is achieved, uh, this will cater for at least 80 to 90 percent of the mm. total volume of missiles which are coming into Israel. And uh, the rest, I presume, they will be able to handle by other means. So this was expected, but I still feel it is going to be limited. And uh, hopefully, before um, uh, at some point of time, there will be a ceasefire. I think Lebanon, uh, Lebanon, uh, in my view, Lebanon has got an opportunity now to see that the Hezbollah is rendered null and void, and it cannot interfere in the local politics of the area. Will they see that opportunity? Time will tell. But if uh, the Lebanese, Lebanese government now keeps the Hezbollah, Hezbollah. out, especially their armed wing out, I think there is a very good chance of peace, and the peace which will come now will be long term. Okay. Okay. General Katoch, then let me also understand from you, you know, these attacks are targeted against Hezbollah. They've lost most of their top leadership, including Hassan Nasrullah. Uh, they are looking for a replacement. Uh, but how, how, how um, you know, efficient do you think Hezbollah is at the current moment? Uh, to retaliate against Israel, to respond to these attacks. They have been saying that they will retaliate, that there will be a response. Um, and, uh, you know, Iran also is, is, is expected, uh, as the United States says, to launch a ballistic missile against Israel. Do you think they are and they have the military capabilities to actually respond uh, to Israel at the current moment? Uh, the way I look at it is their military capability has not been rendered zero. It has been very severely downgraded, uh, very severely degraded. But that does not mean that they are not in a position to retaliate. I think uh, they are still in a position, uh, even today, some missiles have been fired onto Israel, and most of those missiles <coughs> fell into the sea. So what has happened is their tactical level leadership has been taken out to a very large extent, and the upper leadership from Nasrullah downwards has also been neutralized to a very large extent. But there are still elements there which are capable of fighting. And uh, to that extent, those missiles have been fired by, uh, uh, by, fired by the Hezbollah onto Israeli territory. And a very large number of those missiles have actually gone on, onto the sea. Uh, so that means the capability and the accuracy, etc., all that has been impacted. But what Israel is really looking for is not a single missile should be fired from Lebanon onto Israeli territory. Now, that will be the first step towards peace. And I think this, uh, this invasion which has taken place now, the uh, mo forward movement of the Israeli ground forces, is to ensure that the artillery fire and the missile fire from within southern Lebanon, at least, does not come onto Israeli settlements, which means that any missiles which have to be fired will have to be long-distance missiles. And uh, the proportion of long-distance missiles to shorter-distance missiles available in any armory is huge. Uh, the longer-distance missiles, I presume, they will, they will be able to take on in different ways, either through direct destruction uh, or they will, the iron room will be adequate to look after that. Okay. But the shorter missiles do pose a problem, and this ground invasion will render that problem over. Okay. Um 
General Katosh, let me also welcome Eli Karman, Senior Researcher, International Institute for Counterterrorism. He's joining us from Israel on the broadcast. Uh, Mr. Eli Karman, thank you very much for joining us on Mirror Now. Let me begin by asking you the fact that, uh, you know, Israel is calling this ground offensive as a limited operation with no long-term occupation. Um, help us understand what is a limited operation. Operation. What does it mean in this context? What is long term? What is what what defines long term? What is that timeline? I think, uh, thank you for having me on your show. Uh, you know, uh, every uh, operation uh, begins with a, a limited, if you want, uh, a goal, uh, and uh, it uh, develops according to the circumstances. And at this moment, uh, what uh, IDF uh, intends to do is to uh, find and to destroy most of the infrastructure of Hezbollah uh, in uh, southern Lebanon. Uh, we already saw, and I think you give now uh, the uh, pictures, uh, the videos of the tunnels that are there for many years. They prepared this in order to attack and to northern Israel, the uh, Galilee region of uh, Israel. So uh, much of it is uh, in uh, open, uh, if you want, uh, territory, but also many are in houses, private houses, sometimes even in mosques or the schools, like in Gaza, you saw in Gaza uh, during the uh, last months. Uh, so this is the first uh, step in order to destroy the uh, infrastructure, to kill uh, all the fighters that will try to stop the IDF, and then to try to achieve uh, uh, an agreement, a diplomatic agreement, uh, which uh, uh, practically returns to the uh, Security Council decision 7001 of 2006. Hezbollah forces shouldn't stay south of the river Litani. Any presence of uh, this organization would be forbidden. And also, the Lebanese army should take control together with an international force that will monitor it, like the Unifil. But until today, we see that the uh, army of Lebanon is not able, it's important, to stop Hezbollah. And the same we can say about the Unifil, which is an international uh, multi-force. I think sometimes they have also Indian uh, units inside it. Uh, and uh, this, on the background of the success of uh, the uh, Israeli uh, uh, agencies, which includes the intelligence, the Mossad, the army, to practically uh, kill most of the leadership, uh, military leadership, and also part of the political leadership. Uh, as you know, the uh, disappearance of uh, Secretary General okay. of Hezbollah, Nasrallah, has changed practically the, uh, uh, if you want, the strategic uh, uh, picture, not only in Lebanon, but also in the region, because uh, Hezbollah is practically a tool of uh, uh, Iran in order to defend its uh, nuclear project. And now they have a problem. They have a problem, and this one. Okay, Mr. Eli Karman, then Jim let me at this point. Yes. You know, let me at this point also understand from you. Israel, for Israel, this fight is for its survival. That's what it has been saying. You're fighting Hamas, you're fighting the Houthis, you're fighting Hezbollah. Um, yes. the, um, the United States has urged restraint. World leaders has, have urged restraint. The United Nations has called for restraint in, in this entire conflict. But that clearly has not been happening. Where does this end now? And when does it end? Uh, as you know, uh, at least 100,000 uh, uh, persons, uh, individuals on our side, not the uh, Galilee, have left their houses. All the infrastructure, urban infrastructure in northern Israel was destroyed by uh, Hezbollah bombings during 11 months. Uh, all the agriculture, uh, if you want, uh, production, uh, most of the urban uh, structure is destroyed. People don't have where to return. So what we want to do is to convince, first of all, Hezbollah, the Lebanese state, and the international community that we have to return to a situation when uh, the northern part or the southern part of Lebanon is controlled, they cannot return to it, and we have to continue 
and uh, monitor this kind of, uh, uh, if you want, the, uh, disarmed uh, territory in order that our people could return to their homes, to rebuild their houses, to rebuild their agricultural camps and so on. Okay. Uh, General Katoch, you know, let me also understand from you the fact that United States and President Joe Biden have been calling out Netanyahu uh, and urging him for restraint, urging him to de-escalate. Uh, the fact that Prime Minister Netanyahu is defying all of these directions by world leaders, uh, does it also point to uh, the kind of reality that perhaps United States is seeing about itself at the current moment, the fact that its own ally uh, somebody he's supported, somebody the country has supported and the governance has supported, is not listening to it um, in, in the kind of, uh, you know, current situation that we are in, in the kind of geopolitical uh, ups and downs that we are witnessing. Uh, look, uh, the uh, Netanyahu government has its own errors and mistakes. You know, uh, uh, I think... In, in the, in Mr. Carmon, I'll come to you. This was for General Katoch. Um, thank you. You know, in my view, if the United States puts pressure on Lebanon and on the Hezbollah and tells them to stop firing missiles, that may be a better option. For Israel, it is an existential question. If, you, if Israel does not take action, on a daily basis, missiles are being fired by the Hezbollah onto Israeli territory. 70,000, 80,000 people have been displaced from their homes. Now, this is a situation which cannot go on indefinitely. And I think Israel was duty bound to act to protect its citizens. That is the way I have looked at it. Now, for, for the US, they can talk. Uh, you know, it, uh, I, I, I also support the call for peace. We want peace in that area. And Prime Minister Modi has also said that. The US president is saying the same thing. But peace requires two parties. Now, Israel will be prepared to stop all action if the Hezbollah moves out of southern Lebanon and, uh, and gives a commitment that they will not use any missiles or any other means of firing onto Israel. So let the Israeli settlements come in and then the people who have evacuated southern Libya, uh, southern Lebanon uh, from the uh, Lebanon side, they can also come back to their homes. But uh, you see, it cannot be one-sided. If, if all the restraint has been exercised by Israel, there will never be peace. And from the side of the, uh, the, the terrorist groups, the Hezbollah, the Hamas, the Houthis, uh, Iran has continuously stated that we want to throw the Israel into the sea. You know, uh, that very famous quote which they keep saying, uh, from the river to the sea, uh, Palestine shall be free. That means they don't want yeah. to give any space to Israel to live. So for Israel, it is an, it, in my view, it is an existential problem. They have to defend themselves regardless of what the United States says. When it comes to life and death, Israel will choose life, even if they have to go against the United States. That's the way I look at it. And, and therefore, General Katoch, regardless of what the United States says, uh, why should Lebanon or Hezbollah or Iran listen to them then? It has come uh, uh, to their survival, quote-unquote, uh, as well. It has come on to their self-respect as well. And this is going to be a face-saving moment for them. If they don't attack now, uh, you know, their, their top leadership is already completely destroyed. No, I think as far as the Hezbollah is concerned, um, there, are, there are very large groups, even in southern Lebanon, which are Shia. Uh, you see, if, it's very important to understand the way the population is distributed. There's a very large Christian population, there's a very large Muslim population, and the Muslim population is generally dis uh, distributed between the Shia and the Sunni. Now, the Shias are in southern Lebanon, to, uh, the, uh, the vast majority, about 80 to 90 percent um, uh, of the population of southern Lebanon is Shia, and then they've got uh, an equal amount of population in the north, in between other Christians and the Sunnis and other groups. So, uh, in southern Lebanon, there have been celebrations because even the, even the Shias want peace. The Hezbollah has been fighting for war, but mm. now the time has come when the local civilians there are saying, if you want to fire your missiles, don't fire them from our villages. Fire them elsewhere, because they, are, they know that the retaliation which will come will destroy them. 
So I think uh, the Hezbollah has to listen. They cannot, it, this cannot be a one-sided war by which uh, the Hezbollah carries on doing what it does. The Hamas, of course, has been neutralized. Uh, as far as Iran is concerned, I think they will be very cautious. Uh, if, they actually, if they actually weigh the pros and cons, the, Iran is going to lose either way. If they don't attack, they will be seen as weak. They lose prestige. If they do attack, they will lose even heavier. Uh, it will be a mm. very, very heavy loss to them. I'm afraid that nuclear facilities will be attacked and they will be taken out. Okay. So uh, Iran has to take the call. And the first okay. call which Iran took is the, uh, the Ayatollah took personal shelter. He's run away. So that is the call which they are taking. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much to both of you gentlemen, General Katoch and Ellie Carbon for joining us and sharing your perspectives. Let's see how this really moves forward. Uh, but for now, uh, this is a wait and watch game as to how Hezbollah and Iran respond to this entire ground offensive, the latest development in this escalation in West Asia. Thank you very much to both of you gentlemen. Uh, on the broadcast, ladies and gentlemen, I'm also joined by Sabri Saidam. He's a former Minister of Education and Communications and Information Technology uh, from Palestine. Sabri Saidam, thank you very much for joining us on Mirror Now and talking with us. My first question to you, Mr. Saidam, uh, how do you see this latest escalation by Israel, a ground offensive, Operation Northern Arrows completely shifting focus to the southern Lebanon now? Well, uh, let me start by saying that this is uh, expected. If you recall Netanyahu last September, uh, a few days before October 7th, I had shown a map before the international community at the General Assembly of the UN, in which he stated that he takes up the responsibility of rearranging the Middle East, uh, chopping out uh, Palestine off his map, and not mentioning anything about uh, peace, nor did he mention anything about the Palestinians. So he has not only finished Gaza, he's turned to Lebanon, maybe Iraq, Yemen later, and the West Bank, maybe other destinations. Who knows? Netanyahu feels now that he has the power, he has the support, and he has the cover from the American administration to do what he does. Mr. Saidam, you know, uh, Israel has been reiterating its argument in this entire conflict, in this entire escalation, uh, that for, for Israel, it is a question of survival, because it is fighting uh, the Houthis, the you know, Hamas group, and of course, the Hezbollah. Um, how do you really see it? You know, how do you, how do you see the fact that Israel uh, has been fighting this for what it calls its survival? Well, let me say that uh, had Israel given in to the will of the international community, given back the land to Palestinians upon the request of the, that community and upon the UN resolutions, we wouldn't have been here. Instead, Israel has dragged on this conflict for years on end, if not decades on end, and has turned its back to the will and wish of the people of the world and decided to basically, uh, basically grab as much lands, uh, land as it desires. So that actually closes the door on uh, the ability of Israel to be absorbed by the international community's uh, wish to reconsider a matter that is of top urgency. This matter focuses on giving back the rights and the lands to the Palestinians so that a Palestinian state can come into being. With that attitude, with this uh, policy of aggression that Israel has adopted over the years, with the expansion of settlements, the confiscation of land, the plundering of water of Palestinians, is uh, certainly the scene, as it were, uh, becomes imminent. So it is Israel to blame, and that's exactly what Netanyahu wanted to see, a map that is so distorted, an environment that's so polluted, so that he appears to be the victim. This victimization of Israel is of its own making. Israel wanted the to attack everyone. Israel attacked the Palestinians, disrespected the wish of the people of the world, turned its back to the international community and your resolutions, as I said, and led the scene into disaster, an eruption of, uh, of Palestinian rejectionism, of existence of this uh, mode of fighting the people, the land, and their identity is basically a result of what Israel has been perpetrating over years on end. Mr. Saidam, you know, you say that Israel has got it upon itself. It is the perpetrator in this conflict. Israel uh, quotes 
and reiterates the six-day war that happened and how it was attacked and how it survived that war. Well, my dear, so is the case with Israel claiming that 7th of October has led us to where we are today. Mind you, you know, uh, Israel has used the 7th of October to kill the Palestinians. Uh, indeed, we don't, as Palestinians, celebrate nor rejoice any killing of any human being. We will not in any way endorse any killing of uh, uh, any man or woman, regardless of their walk of life. But to come and kill people at the magnitude that happened in Gaza, the uh, bulldoze uh, property of the Palestinian, the size of Gaza, to confiscate the dreams and aspirations of the Palestinian people is totally unjustified. Where on earth would you see a society killing 42,000 people? And that's, uh, again, is a modest figure. Where on earth would you see a land that's the size of Gaza being bulldozed in its entirety? Where would you see uh, uh, people being uh, imprisoned as much as the Palestinians were in occupied Palestinian, in Palestine, but here in this uh, part of the world? Israel has to blame itself for the failure of, uh, of living up to the promises and the wishes of the international, international community. And Israel is okay. to blame for thinking that force can really deter the wish and will of the Palestinian people. Mr. Saidam, I believe, unfortunately, you lost your family as well in this conflict with Israel. Uh, and I'm sure you would like this to end as well. You would like this violence, this bloodshed, this chaos to end as well. Where does this end? How will it end? Well, uh, let me say that the application of common sense is certainly the way forward. The two-state solution, the application of your resolutions, and the respect and dignity for Palestinians is what leads to the respect and dignity of the Israelis. Those who are claiming that they are the friends of Israel, your friend is, is someone who should show care and consideration. And the world should turn to Israel and say that our care and consideration is focused and bent on giving back the uh, land to the Palestinians, allowing a Palestinian state to come into being, and stop this madness and believe that weapons will win you. The, the distress of Palestinians and their expulsion and deportation. I lost a big portion of my family indeed, but I remain adamant as a Palestinian to see a different reality, a future that's much brighter and sees this opportunity that leads us to uh, ending of this madness and application of common sense and the departure of this mad Israeli government so that a sensible Israeli government comes into the scene whereby it recognizes the policy of live and let live. All right, we'll leave it there. Hopefully, uh, this conflict, this violence, this bloodshed will end soon, Mr. Saidam, and both sides uh, will have peace. Their children will have peace, and there will be generations that will see peace on both sides. Thank you very much for talking with us, Mr. Sabri Saidam, on Mirror Now and sharing your perspective. Thank you very much.